there's plenty of warning about when a substance is going to be subject to authorization or licensing. Uh, the candidate listing is a substance of very high concern. It's first start. That's advised on by the member state committee at ECA. That's a representative committee of the member states, as the name suggests. Goes on to Annex 14 inclusion if it's decided. I'm going to talk today about two other committees. That's the Committee for Risk Assessment and the Committee for Socioeconomic Analysis, who work together to advise the European Commission on applications for authorization. Some def basic definitions. An authorization will be granted by the Commission if the risk to human health or the environment from the use of a substance arising from the intrinsic properties specified in Annex 14, and you can see them below there, carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, toxicity to reproduction, PBT, VP, VB, or that strange one we came across earlier this morning, equivalent concern. Taking into account the opinion of the Committee for Risk Assessment. For non-threshold substances, for example, non-threshold carcinogens would be the obvious one. An authorization may only be granted if it is shown that socioeconomics outweigh the risk to human health or the environment, and if there's no suitable alternatives. So that brings us into a, a, a set of downstream, a cascade of uh, pieces of information which we have to evaluate. So the Committee for, so for Risk Assessment and the Socioeconomic Analysis Committee have to look at the appropriateness and effectiveness of the risk management measures, RMMs. In the case of the Risk Assessment Committee, the RAC, uh, we look whether there's adequate control or no adequate control. And then the socioeconomic benefits and the implications of a refusal to authorize are looked at by SEAC. Analysis of alternatives and any substitution plan in a later phase where it's clear what the substitute might be is looked at by SEAC. And this last item on our list, our checklist, is that the risks of alternative substances or technologies need to be looked at by both committees. That's a pretty tall order. It's very hard to risk assess something which you're just basically given a name on a piece of paper. You could do a comparative hazard assessment, but risk will prove difficult, we think. We prepare and agree on an opinion within 10 months. So as soon as the fee is paid by the applicant, the clock starts running, and we have 10, min 10 months to provide an opinion, no matter what. There's no stop the clock mechanism. It runs on regardless. The opinion, once it's ready, is forwarded to the Commission. It includes a response to comments table. That's to take care of transparency. Uh, the process for identifying substances of very high concern is quite long. Plenty of warning that authorization is on its way. Uh, we've heard some of the elements talked about earlier this morning, so I won't go into any detail. The roadmap for substances of very high concern has been mentioned. Registry of intentions is something where all of ECHA's uh, material is published to give you a warning of when things are happening. Candidate list and the authorization list. In preparation for going into full service, we developed a document called Common Approach of RAC and SEAC. That's on the website. It's, if you're an applicant, it's really worthwhile looking at because it tells you really how the committees will evaluate these applications. And one of the things in the mandate of the committees is to recommend on the length of the review period. You can imagine if you're a, a, an industry uh, making plans to try and substitute an, a substance of very high concern, the short review period, the neutral of seven years or the long of 12 years could be very critical to your efforts. So on the hazard side of the risk assessment equation, we put together reference values in committee, agree on them. These are non-legally binding advisory values. For example, we, for threshold substance, we derive no effect levels, publish them, and for non-threshold, we derive dose-response relationships and publish those. So effectively, the, the hazard section of the chemical safety report uh, can be very short. You accept the committee's reference values and move along. So far in applications, these have generally been very well taken up. I think about 95% uh, of applications have, ha have used the reference values as published. There's a number of components here which I think are of value to be aware of. A pre-submission information session can be requested by the applicant seeking ECHA advice. And that is, that is simply a session with ECHA staff involved in the authorization process where as an applicant you can come along, talk to them, 
present your pre-proposal and get advice on how to handle it further. From our point of view, highly recommended. And I think uh, the take-up rate has been very good and the feedback afterwards has actually been very positive. The public consultation. Um, once the process starts, there's a 60-day public consultation. It's not a general consultation. It's specifically intended to gather information on alternatives. There is a further part of the process which I think is important to mention. It's called the trialogue. This is a formal meeting between the applicant when the evaluation is already started, between the RAC and SEAC rapporteurs, with stakeholders including competitors present, uh, if, if invited, and it's hosted by ECA. These trialogues, you could see them as a sort of a dry run for a committee, as an opportunity to present the case in a, a smaller setting than committee, and to get feedback on uh, what your, your line of thinking is and your way of presenting it. I think for applicants, it's also a, a key point of where you can fine tune what you're going to present in the final application to committee. The analysis of alternatives is a fairly key document. Um, really, we, we want to see what the alternatives are that you're proposing at this point. Substitution plans are usually there if the applicant is well on their way to, to, to introducing an alternative. Um, another key message, the socioeconomic analysis is really a critical item in the package. Uh, even if you've got a threshold substance and you're applying for adequate control, if you don't achieve that for whatever reason, the backup of the socioeconomic analysis is, becomes very critical. My committee has to evaluate the risks uh, for whichever type of substance, but we make a recommendation to our sister committee, and according to the legislation, they decide based on the socioeconomics. So that's something to bear in mind. One of the tools which my committee can use and does is additional conditions and monitoring arrangements. That's one way to get control uh, over the risks in the workplace. And particularly on what would happen to the applicant and their downstream users in socioeconomic terms should the authorization not be granted. So there's a zero option built in there into the socioeconomic analysis. Technical and economic feasibility of the alternatives is looked at in, in as far as that detail is contained in the dossier, and the length of the review period is decided really by both committees accordingly. Good news is that in all cases so far, the committees have in effect recommended to the Commission that authorization should be granted. I think that's a, a, a key message. I was asked in my own committee uh, in September whether we would ever reject one. And my answer was, yes, I could see circumstances in which we would. There would be fairly exceptional circumstances, but nonetheless, it's not a rubber stamping operation. If the risk were perceived to be high or the exposure is uncertain, RAC has generally recommended a short review period, and this can be coupled to additional conditions or not. Uh, some general advice, if you're taking a modeling approach to risks or exposures, try and validate with monitoring and vice versa. It helps the committee greatly if there's some sort of cross-check in the dossier built in to give us an idea of validity. Really, in the Risk Assessment Committee, essential safety information has to be non-confidential. There's no really other way around that. A large section of chemical safety reports marked confidential are impossible for us to work with. We, we can't evaluate them. It's as simple as that. So I, I think the message I would give is that when, when you're signing a contract to get a letter of access to somebody else's chemical safety report, look at the small print and be very careful as to what kind of confidentiality conditions you're signing up to, because the information has to be able to be usable in committee. Make use of the pre-submission information sessions if you can. If it's feasible for you, it could help you greatly. Try and use the trialogue if you can, and be aware of the RAC DNLs and dose response relationships. They could help you along the way. Uh, there are many regular ECA and industry sponsored seminars, webinars, workshops. There's something almost every month uh, with some relevance to authorization at the moment.